Lawrence Krauss is a theoretical physicist, and he's an author of several books. You may see his face and hear his voice at several free thought events around the country and, in fact, around the world. And he is hot off the release of a new book called The Greatest Story Ever Told So Far. Lawrence Krauss joins me here. Dr. Krauss, good to talk to you. It's always good to talk to you, Seth. So (laughs) you've sort of punctuated your book with some biblical language, which I just love. Genesis, (laughs) Exodus, Revelation. You know, yeah, it adds yeah, a profundity yeah. to like, the work. Yeah, well, I don't know if that's what it adds, but it certainly it seems to aggravate some people. So I suppose it's it served its purpose. Have you gotten some blowback already from people yeah, saying how presumptuous? You know, there, was, there was a review of my book in the scientific journal Nature, where the guy basically didn't, I mean, didn't talk. About it. It, it amazed me. He been, he was offended that I used the term Exodus, and somehow I I could compare the the 40 year long search for the Higgs to the, to the noble 40 year long, you know, search in the desert. I I was just amazed. I mean, I just, it was amusing. And it was, it was, the point is that this is the greatest story ever told so far, the real story of the universe. And for fun, it was nice to, to make biblical allusions and, and, and make section headings that it seemed appropriate to Genesis, Exodus, Revelations. It was just a little bit of amusement and to, and to focus on it, I found rather, you know, people take it, these things very seriously. They're pedantic about it. Honestly, it's just, I, I think if Yahweh exists, he's probably chuckling along with you, right? I mean, no. Yeah, well, one, would hope, one would hope so. Um, this guy was a philosopher, so he takes everything seriously, I guess. That's the problem. I'm not even going in, into the philosophy. I, I, I'm not I, going there. Good, uh, good. But, I don't want, yeah. In any case, uh, the bottom line is, yeah, I look, the Bible's got a lot of good quotes, and I thought— why not uh, start each chapter with a biblical quote that was relevant to what I was talking about? Because I do want to make the connection between what was, I assume, for the time for people, the greatest story we're told, and their understanding of the world when they, before they understood the world. And now we understand the world in a different way. And so I saw no, nothing wrong with making um, that comparison and pointing out that the so far part is the most important thing. The, the fact that our story changes, and that's a good thing. It doesn't remain the same. Every time we learn something new, the story gets better. I'm reminded of Christopher Hitchens when he would speak about how, because religion was the first explanation for our origins and the universe, because it was our first, it was our worst. Would you agree with that? Well, it's always, yeah. Every explanation that where we learn a little bit more is better than the, the one that precedes it. And today's explanation won't be as good as tomorrow's, because we'll learn, we'll know more tomorrow than we do today. That's the whole point. The fact that it changes the fact that it's not immutable is its greatest strength, because it means we learn. Well, that brings me to my next question, and forgive my ignorance, I just saw a few, I saw a headline in a few paragraphs about the potential discovery of a new particle that might change what we think about the standard model. It was, you know, I just sort of did a drive-by of it. Are you familiar with the story? And Well, uh, uh, is it one this week? Because there's been potential discoveries of new particles you know, uh, reported often over the last two years at the Large Hadron Collider, and they've gone away. And so I don't know about this week's story, but my well, you know, I talked to people and I talked to them about the fact that, well, there may be some revision. Science may have to go back and revise some of what it has. And they give me that aha moment. Aha. Well, you know, it re- when it's really important to point out revise. I mean, I talk about this in my book a lot. What satisfied the test of experiment will never be changed. Newton's laws work for the for baseballs and cannonballs and whatever we learn about quantum gravity in the far future they'll continue to be correct so when we when we say revise what we mean is that we that 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 our that our fundamental understanding is revised but in a way that is still consistent with what we know to be true and by what what i mean by that is what we know has survived the test of experiment so people tend the biggest misconception about science is that people think we Every scientific revolution throws out everything that went before, and that's and then they figure why bother learning science because you know tomorrow it'll be different than today. So it's always just a fad. That's not the case. Newton's laws are correct. Galileo was correct. You know we've we've changed the laws of physics at the extremes of scale. And if we discover a new particle, it may mean that our fundamental understanding has changed, but not in a way that's going to invalidate the explanations of nature that already work. So defend the title of the book. I mean, science, the greatest story, greater than the story of Yahweh, Jesus, Allah. Oh, of course that. I mean, that's a kind of, that's not even as interesting as the Odyssey or, the, or, or you know, <laughs> but, but, I mean, uh, as I point out in the book. But but uh, it is the humanity's search and willingness to go 
where we didn't want to go and be dragged kicking and screaming by the process of science to 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 understand the fundamental workings of nature is is one of the most remarkable human intellectual journeys that we've ever taken i would argue it's the greatest intellectual journey we've ever taken and then based on those those ideas which were rather extreme and extraordinary we built the most complicated machine ever built so far and we and people spent 50 years of their lives trying to develop it there are those who argue that the bible is actually even crappy literature you know it's not even really a compelling book right the bible is most of the bible is boring there are parts of it that are lyrically beautiful and, and i tried and i like that's why i chose quotes from them the lyric as a as a as a piece of human writing there are parts of it that are really interesting bits of literature i mean you know the psalms have beautiful poems and that sort of things so you know like any like any book of that length which by the way mostly has things stolen from the current era as my friend anthony grayling wrote a, a modern version of the bible called the good book which stole um without god of course which stole sort of literature and psalms and songs from the current time that the bible did just that as well and something took the good and the bad i mean you know that much of the bible with this begat that begat that begat that you know it's kind of boring yeah um but the, the bottom line is which is intellectually more fascinating and certainly the real universe which is the imagination of the universe is so much greater than the imagination of humans that of course the story of the real universe is more fascinating because we couldn't come up with this stuff. The human imagination couldn't come up with the Higgs field alone if it weren't sort of driven in that direction. Nature, that's why we have to keep our windows open, our eyes open, because the minute we sort of turn inward and try and discover things by revelation, we don't get anywhere. We discover things by letting the universe uh, inform us, and we have new telescopes and machines, so every time we do a new experiment, we are surprised, and that's what makes it so wonderful. That surprising nature of reality is what makes the story so great. Is that your response to those who say, there are people starving all over the world, we have all these resource challenges here on planet Earth, why why build the most expensive machine ever created by man? Why well, fund these expeditions to the stars and the telescopes, etc.? Well, look, 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 there's an argument. We, if it was either or, I think, I think it would be really a, a, an important question. It's not either or. Let's face it, the Higgs, the, the Large Hadron Collider cost $10 billion over 20 years, which is, you know, in total, probably less than a week of the air conditioning bill in Iraq <laughs> during the war. But, uh, um, and, and so it's, you know, the, the sums of money we're talking about on an on a, on a international scale are not extreme. Nevertheless, the public funds this, and the public should have a right to make decisions about funding. But they need to. But we need to explain why we're doing what we do. But the bottom line is, the entire national budget of the National Science Foundation is maybe three or four billion dollars, something in that range, which is which is just minuscule compared to the other things we spend money on. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be devoting our resources to improving the planet, to combating climate change, to feeding the world to, in fact, educating women so that we don't overpopulate the world. Uh, these are vitally important questions in the 21st century, and we can't ignore them. But we, you know, instead, but, but the right way to do it is to, is to, is to try and do it through education and, and encouragement of, uh, of, of, of entrepreneurship, not to build walls and to, and to build weapons and to bomb things. That's not going to solve the problem. Take a cost of a, of a, of a major, uh, a uh, modern airplane, it's probably the cost of the Large Hadron Collider. Anyway. It's interesting that your book releases in kind of a culture where science is under attack. We're seeing sort of this dismissal, at least from, you know, an administration, a presidential administration, kind of a dismissal of science and scientists. And many of them are sort of worried not just about their jobs, but about the future of scientific progress here in the United States. Yeah, I wrote a piece in, in, I think, December, The New Yorker called Donald Trump's War on Science, and it seemed to be, I guess, in retrospect, it's prescient. Well, it was pretty obvious that he surrounded himself with people who deny reality for the sake of ideology or greed. He himself doesn't really have nearly knowledge of any of it, so I don't think he can make informed decisions. And that's the real problem. A democracy works when we can make informed decisions about reality. That means when the voters have enough understanding of what the issues are and, and and reality versus nonsense to decide who their legislators should be and then when the legislators can base their public policy on empirical evidence and that's part of the interesting you know the relevance of the greatest story we told so far as well it's 
I talk about very esoteric things in that book, the forefront of our modern understanding of nature. But what we've learned is that the universe we see is an illusion. And the, the reality we experience is an illusion, and we've been able to cut through that that fabric hiding the, the real universe beneath it by using the techniques of science. Well, if we can do that to understand the universe, those same techniques of skeptical inquiry, empirical testing, uh, constantly uh, uh, questioning yourself over and over again, those techniques could be used to strip through the, the illusion of reality in Washington. And, and we, need, we need to use the same techniques of science, the process of science, to separate the wheat from the chaff. Too often we teach science as if it's a set of facts. It's not. It's a process for deriving facts. And in that case, there are no alternative facts. In the process of writing, researching, and writing the book, what were some of the biggest surprises for you or the things that excited you the most? I know it sounds a little bit like a sort of a trite reporter's question, but I'm really well, genuinely well, I mean, interested. You know, you do this all the time, but what it really rang your bell when you were putting this piece together? Well, you know, I, I studied the history a lot. I thought, I, as of, always the case when I read a book, sometimes I think I know something, and then when I start to think about it more, I realize I don't. And particularly the history was fascinating for me to uncover. And what I guess I really hit home is the important thing to realize that, first of all, the secret that scientists are human. And um, and by that, I mean they, that individual scientists can have, you know, be pigheaded and prejudiced and biased. And, and you see that in, in the history of the, the, the dead ends. In the 1960s, the right answer to understanding two of the fundamental forces of nature was sitting there in a way, but people were so fixated on this other direction that they, they didn't look at it for a long time. You want to shake them. And you can see how, uh, once again, you know, the human aspect of science, people get fixated on often the wrong direction. But what's wonderful is you see how the science, the evidence eventually forces people in the right direction. And so people often claim, you know, scientists are this or scientists are that. And indeed they are, but you can't judge science by scientists alone. The scientists are humans, and humans are not just rational beings. We're, you know, reason is a slave of passion for humans. And and and, but what we see is the power of the of the data to eventually uh, really take these people reluctantly in the right direction. And I guess I hadn't realized how powerfully all of the there were so many clues to the right answer in the 1960s um, that that uh, that that weren't weren't seen. And and also it reinforced for me something which I was one of the reasons I wrote the book, but I hadn't realized how, how appropriate it was, perhaps. So that is, when people understand the history of science, they often think of the early decades of the 20th century, from 1905 to 1925, as being the most revolutionary period we discovered special relativity, general relativity, quantum mechanics. But I would argue the period from sort of 1955 to 1975, which is largely unsung, is more revolutionary. We started that period understanding one of the four forces of nature. By 1975, we understood three of the four forces of nature exactly, and the fundamental mathematical symmetries that appear to guide all physical theories. It was an incredible period of development, and we understood that the universe we see, as I say, is this illusion that, that the very things that make you and I up, the particles that make you and I up, their mass at a fundamental scale doesn't exist that way. It's a, We're only here because of this accident of this invisible field that froze in the early history of the universe, allowing us to exist. Once again, the, the, a universe that seems designed for us is not designed for us at all at a fundamental scale. It's in fact incompatible with our existence. It's only because this background field froze in the way it did that, that and it, if it had frozen in a different way, we wouldn't be here. The example I use in the book, and I often like to use, is, is, is ice crystals on a window. If you look at a window in the wintertime, you see ice crystals in all sorts of different directions. If you lived, if your civilization lived on one of those crystals, then the spine of that crystal, the direct, that direction would seem special. The laws of physics would be different along that direction than other directions. Religions would develop, and they'd explain why God intended that direction to be special. And wars would be fought over whether that direction or that direction was special. All these things. And, of course, it's an accident, an accident to existence. And we understand that now that mo many of the things about our universe that seem so special are a similar accident of our existence. The universe wasn't designed for us. We're lucky to be here, and we should enjoy it, but um, but we're not the center of the universe. I'm reminded of Douglas Adams. Was it uh, Adams who had talked about the puddle inside the pothole? And it said, you know, hey, this seems perfectly designed for me. I fit in it just, you know, just perfectly. This must be, I must be its destiny kind of thing. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. The example I often use is, it isn't, isn't it just amazing? It's unbelievable that your feet reach down exactly to the ground. 
how much can we really know about the universe? I mean, considering the very small blip that we have and the very small sort of range of eyesight that we have as a species, I mean, how much can we really know? Who knows? That's the great thing. We don't know how much we can know. People always say, well, science will never do this or science will never do that. And I say, what incredible conceit there is in that statement, because if you know what science will never do, you must know something that science doesn't know. So we haven't, maybe there are fundamental limits to what we can understand. There may be. We haven't hit them yet. Do you the only think so? way we can find out is by trying. Do you think like, we'll ever be able to determine what caused the Big Bang, which is usually what happens when we talk about the singularity? They're like, oh, yeah, will it happen? You have evidence. Great. You see the universe expanding. Great. What caused the Big Bang? Do you think we'll ever get to a point? I know you're theorizing, but what do you think? Well, as I wrote in one of my books, uh, my Universe from Nothing, the Big Bang may have had no cause. Cause, if time began at, at the Big Bang, then there was no before, and therefore there was no causality at that instant. So the whole no classical notion of cause and effect may go out the window. Maybe that's not true. We don't know. But do I think we'll ever know? Maybe. I see no obstacle to if we can get enough data, as long as we can continue to look and find signals from the, the early universe, like gravitational waves from the beginning of time, we'll learn more. Maybe we'll never know. Maybe we'll know. My head Doesn't just exploded, me. by the way. It may not have had a cause. just caused my head to explode. Excellent. Like I'm Excellent. watching the That's last the 20 science. minutes of Interstellar at this moment. Yeah. I'm just not processing. Yeah. So. yeah, but unlike the last 20 minutes of Interstellar, this one, this has <laughs> meaning. But um, uh, 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 the, the, uh, the, the point is that, that science, we don't know. We, and, and every day, we, you know, maybe we'll never learn everything, and that's fine. But every day we'll learn a little bit more than the day before. And and um, not knowing what the limits are should not stop you. It's part the reason, you know, the reason this is the greatest story ever told so far is kind of as I think about it here on the West Coast in Oregon right now where I am is that, you know, I think of Lewis and Clark. Not knowing if there's an end to the journey, not knowing where you're finally going is part of the adventure, part of what makes the adventure so exciting. Walk me through the book. What are you trying to accomplish? Is this, you know, or is it a science book? What I'm going look, what I did, I think this book naturally follows on my last one, Universe of Nothing, which explored the revolutionary developments that have taken place in our understanding of the largest things in the universe and what the, how, how that impacts on one fundamental existential question that humans have. Why is there something rather than nothing? This book follows on that by looking at how, how our revol the revolutionary developments in our understanding of nature at its smallest scales, at its most fundamental scales, and how that impacts on another existential question. Why are we here? So what I wanted to do was inform, change people's perspective of, on the question, why are we here, by understanding the remarkable set of, of, of phenomena and, 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 and that, that result in our existence and that are largely unheralded, that, unheralded the, the, those revolutionary developments that, are, that we really haven't talked about much about in the last 50 years that have changed our perspective of our place in the universe. And in that sense, as I often say, my book and, and, and a science book and science in general is just like art, music, and literature. The best part about it is to change our perspective of our place in the universe. So oh, this book, if it serves its purpose, when you read it, will change. When you finish it, you'll have a different perspective of where you are and where you come from and what the universe is all about. And if you have some fun in the process, all, all, all the more exciting. Is this an exponential advancement? You know, our knowledge about the cosmos and our place in it? Are you seeing it just ramping up? At, at no, I mean, science is certainly, if you look at the, at the progress of science since 1900, we seem to have progressed far more in the last 100 years than we did in the last, in, in the 500 years before that and thousands of year before, years before that. Because we have, because of technology due to science, our tools to explore the universe are expanding all the time. And that's what determines the progress of science, not just thinking, but those tools that we use that give us new windows. And we're and they're in every area from biology to physics to every area, those tools are indeed expand, exponentially increasing, I suppose. So and that's part of the problem because technology is advancing at a rapid rate and society may not be it's not necessarily able to cope e easily institutionally with those developments. And how we handle that, especially when it comes later on to things like machine learning, and the, will be will determine, I think, the quality of the future we have. Forgive another, but some would consider a trite question, but I have to ask: Do you think there's life elsewhere? Do you think you know? Certainly, I mean, oh, right? I mean, there's got to be something somewhere, some well, form of I, life. Like when science, we say 
likely or unlikely. And uh, look, there's 100 billion galaxies in the universe today, each has 100 billion stars. We've discovered that pretty well every star we see has planets around it. We just discovered potentially half of planets and around many of the nearest stars. And, and, and life began on Earth as soon as the laws of physics would have allowed it to, as far as we can see, within 500 million years of the formation of the Earth, when the bombardment by comets and other things had died down, life seemed to be here. And, and, and the fundamental ingredients are organic molecules and, 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 and uh, water and sunlight, and all of those are profuse in the universe. So it's hard to believe there isn't life elsewhere in the universe. I suspect there may be even other geneses of life in our solar system. Microbial life, perhaps in the oceans of Europa or Eo, uh, um, or Enceladus, probably, I should say, uh, uh, which may be one of the more exciting places to look. Is there intelligent life? It, I suspect it's incredibly rare, but the great thing about a universe that's big and old is rare events happen all the time. Is there a culture somewhere in another part of the universe that's looking up at the stars? You know, that's writing a book called The Greatest Story of This Side of the Universe So Far. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, we well, can't. I, one hopes so. We certainly, that's one of the questions that we all have. Are we alone in the universe? But, uh, we, you know, and the amazing thing is we're living in a generation where we may answer that question. We, we are not only discovering planets around stars, which 25 years ago would have seemed impossible, but we're probably in the verge in the next 10 years of being able to image them and image atmospheres and look for oxygen. And so we're, we're at the point where we may discover life elsewhere. As I say, uh, I, I think it's a much longer shot to discover intelligent life, but I'd be amazed if it isn't out there and or hasn't been. Remember, the universe is 13 billion years old. The Earth is four and a half billion years old. There is potentially time for many civilizations to have come and gone before us. Um, well, yeah, there's certain requirements before advanced life can form, like the elements, and that takes some time. But so, you know, we'll be gone, too. I mean, people seem to think the universe is made for us and the future is always the same as the present. Our sun will, will end, you know, end its life in five billion years. And, and, and well before that, the Earth will become uninhabitable. Maybe we'll go out into the cosmos. Maybe we'll just disappear and be forgotten. That's OK. Enjoy a brief moment in the sun. I can borrow again from Hitchens where he said, who would forego observing the majesty of the universe to stare at the burning bush, right? I mean, why would you gaze away from the wonderful discoveries of science so that you can look at this ancient and primitive mythology? Well, you think so. You think so. And, and some people are afraid that looking up will cause them to lose their faith in the value of what they see below. And, 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 um, and they're afraid, therefore, to look up, and they don't allow their children to, look, children to look up, which is child abuse. But everyone who sees a Hubble Space Telescope picture is in awe, no matter what their religion. Uh, the, 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 it's only when they start to think, ooh, then maybe that will may, may force me to change some ideas that they close their eyes. But the first time you see these magisterial pictures of the universe and, and what's out there, you can't, no one, you can't help but, but be amazed. You are one of, I think, the greatest science communicators on the planet right now. In fact, I'm listening to you narrate the audio book of The Greatest Story Ever Told So Far, and it's just fantastic stuff. I will include links to the book, both in audio and in paper form and digital form, in the description box of this broadcast. Lawrence Krauss, for your wonderful work and for the new book, thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate the kind words, and it's always a pleasure to listen to you and talk to you.